Yeah, we're in Hello and welcome to the show. We are here on our YouTube channel. We've got a live show for you on Google Plus. This is Thomas Meadows, myself, Hugh T. Alchemy, Thomas in the background. He'll be doing a final lecture tonight for us here in Tempe, Arizona at the Sacred Spiral House. And the subject tonight will be... Uh, we're finishing up our lecture series on Hermetic philosophy and the history thereof. Uh, tonight, uh, first off, I would like to introduce myself as Thomas Michael Robbins, Hermetic instructor, and the reason being for the pen name Thomas Michael Robbins is for personal and esoteric reasons, but I keep it separate from the name given to me as a child as a way of teaching the Hermetic philosophy. And the purpose being is that we've learned from our lecture series that the word hermetic is, in fact, the synonym for secret. So with that being said, the purpose for me using a more characteristic name rather than my government name, which is Thomas Meadows, of course, they're one and the same, as a way of eliminating the self from my teachings and uh, throughout the rest of the teachings you'll see on this YouTube channel from my courses you'll hear me constantly referring to myself as Thomas Michael Robbins the instructor when I instruct as a teacher I then become the hermetic instructor Mr. Robbins when I am out in public dealing with the mundane society I become Mr. Meadows the mild-mannered person so if that helps clears up um, any of the comments that I've received or messages from Facebook, based upon uh, the previous lectures that you folks have been watching at home, that is the reason for the changing of the name. So I hope that clears up those confusions. And now without further ado, we finish up uh, our concluding our lecture series on the history of Hermetic philosophy. The entire origin of this field of thought is filled with mystery and obscure facts which are a compilation of conflicting reports. Out of this conflict itself surrounding the time and conditions of this period, of the beginning of the school, we do, however, gain some practical insight on not just its origin, but also its importance to history. It is assumed the earliest writings we have related to the school of Hermetic philosophy comes from the account of Clement of Alexandria. A Clement's writings include a series of Egyptian ritualistic and practices that had been buried for 3,000 years before our current era. However, much of his accounts we learned from modern day research was misinterpreted on the philosophies of ancient Egypt. Clement's research does check out as we look into his accounts of the Egyptian Greek period from about 400 BCE, which is before current era, or BC, as most of you commonly know it as, to the second century of our current era, also known as CE. Known today as the dynasty of the Ptolemies, which ruled over Rome just before the reign of the Christian era. Clement's writings does not unfortunately approach the central problem of our discussion, namely, who was Hermes. Thus, we seek where other directions for the answer to this question that are not nearly as factual. First thing we discover is that there is no record of how what is called the Corpus Hermeticum came into existence. Uh, the Corpus is made up of a series of writings attributed to a person known as Hermes Trismegistus, 
And several efforts have been made to assume that Hermes was the Egyptian god Thoth, long associated with the concept of wisdom and considered by many to have been intermixed during this critical time period. There is no evidence to support the theory that the Greek Hermes was actually the deity Thoth. Thoth in Egypt has been worshipped for at least 3,000 years before the Christian era. So the question naturally arises, did Thoth ever really exist as an actual real person at any given time? It is generally believed, even in modern times, that so-called deities were originally real people at one time and thought out through their followers of the ancient gods have given them a life and a story passed down through the ages by popular esteem. Plato declares that there's at least five persons that he knew during his life by the name of Hermes. Which means, somewhere along the descent of this name, it was bestowed upon persons as an honorary title. Now, out of this, two possibilities arise. The first is that Thoth was one of the original five elder deities of Egypt, and that he was a divine being, a foundation of worship in certain provinces in central Egypt. The second was that this name was given to persons as a title of honor to indicate that they were Thoth-like or Hermes-like in their respective walk. Early writers claim that Hermes was the deity of universal mind, took the position that a single mind is the author of all works. They believe that behind every book ever written exists a single author that lives in the fertile imaginations of every creative creature in existence. Thus a work can be dedicated to the universal mind as its true author. Works compiled in many different ages are such the case throughout history in every culture and geographical area on this planet. To a deity whose name can be spoken in many different languages. Thoth, or Tot, as it's pronounced in ancient Egypt, inspired teachers who were said to have, have arisen in almost every religion known to mankind and becomes the embody of the principle of wisdom. Morpheus, Mises, Manu and Moses are examples of lawgivers who have said to have been the hands that wrote the principles and teachings of the universal mind in different time periods and areas of the world, who his name as an honorary title in the school of Hermetic philosophy. We then have another thought, which is rather daring and confusing to most students of the esoteric knowledge. And that is that Thoth and Hermes were merely ritualistic personifications and the, symbol, the, the symbolic impersonation of an idea. Uh, with the relative passing of time has created a life for these two controversial characters of history, even though no one seems to know where exactly where they came from, or how they departed from this life. While the two entities seem similar in origin, especially in their stories, are of the same geographical location, the timeline suggests that thousands of years separate Thoth and Hermes, thus under the assumption that if they did actually exist at one time, that we can conclude from the examination of the facts that Thoth and Hermes 
are completely separate, significantly different from each other, and would be two completely different persons in histories and time. This gives us three broad possibilities. One, that we are discussing a deity representing universal consciousness, regarding as the patron saint of a school of wisdom. And this deity was represented by embodiments, and that priests, authors, and scribes bear this name as an honorary title. The third is that they were both ritual figures, much like the physical, um, sorry, the philosophical systems throughout history. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? No. Nope. Perfect. On top of all of this controversy, we come to an intricate problem of dating the Hermetic philosophy. Thus, we usually date a subject by context and structure of the idea presented. Every event of humankind is set up in a place and time. Even the average and highly educated student cannot be 100% unhistorical. They cannot be unknown by the culture and environment that surrounds them. And every thought or idea presented cannot be held outside of the structure of language. Thus, through structure, through forms of grammar, it is always possible to establish a work historically. In the study of Hermetic writings, we learn from the context that they could not have been written before 400 BCE during the Greek peak of uh, Greek philosophy and other elements indicate strong Oriental influence and this Oriental influence is of a type that could not have been written before the age of Pericles. Thus, considering the current dates that we have right now on the, on the dates of the birth of Hermetic philosophy was somewhere between the 4th century BCE and the earliest works are in Greek, or, which are written in Greek, uh, we've now dated somewhere in between the 1st and 2nd century CE or current era. Uh, judging from the context of the Hermetic authors, uh, the Corpus Hermetica must have been compiled over a course of about 300 years, not earlier than the 4th century BCE or later than the beginning of the Christian era. It is traditionally stated that the Corpus Hermeticum contains about 42 works. Uh, the number 42 is highly significant in esoteric history. Uh, those of you who are fans of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy might even get a kick out of this. But even the doctors of the 19th century even had discovered that there are 42 faculties of the human brain. And then up to now, 42 works of the Corpus Hermeticum are not known. And the core work of the Corpus Hermeticum is known as today as the Pyamandries, or the Shepherd of Men. Outside of that existence, other short fragments against this that the corpus currently contains not anywhere close to 42 works. As some believe they may still be sifting through the sands of time, just waiting to be discovered. But we gained this hope from an archaeological dig back in 1946, uh, about 80 kilometers outside of Luxor, uh, where a Gnostic library was discovered and that contained approximately 52 books including with it three previously missing volumes of the Corpus Hermeticum not otherwise known to exist. It is then assumed, the, in this author's opinion, that some 
of them may still be in existence and others might have actually been destroyed in the fire of the Great Library of Alexandria. We study this time period most involved with our discussion, which is about 300 BCE to 200 CE. We see that this period was of strong mental activity. Before, when you conquered a nation, it was assumed their gods were not strong enough to protect them and would then join up with the conquerors. It actually made sense because the locals did not have protection in those days. So it was a good idea to worship in according to which the land in which you lived. All of a sudden, though, this idealism changed and changed in an extraordinary way. We are not sure what caused them to change. But the respect of the gods began to fall due to violence and members of the faith who were deemed false and superstitious were martyred or exiled. The locals of other lands did not change their religions without cause, and this cause was social, economical, and political. The main cause of these changes of patterns was the rise of the Roman Empire. The Romans were the first colonizing people, specializing in a way of life based upon commerce, exchange, and ideas. Uh, to the average Roman, religion was secondary to business. Uh, the Romans had their rituals and prayers, much like others before him. However, they were, in this author's opinion, that they were the first to pray for profit and ask the gods to bring upon inconveniences to his competitors. They also encountered a situation that opened their eyes to a new way of looking at religion. In this process of expanding the Roman Empire, they ran into a huge problem. Rome had to educate and indoctrinate more than a hundred different types of peoples that they had conquered, each with their own different sets of beliefs and religions. From this situation, we can no longer say for certain that the gods of Rome won the battle. The Romans had more faith in their military tactics and machines of war than they did in their own religion. So the peoples conquered did not feel inclined to worship the gods of Rome. Even if they wanted to, the Roman soldiers could not tell them how to do so. For the first time in history, we see the world being banded together without the benefit of the gods. Roman businessmen found out that Romans could not change all of their religions of the peoples that they have conquered, and it would be economically disastrous if they succeeded in doing so. To do so, they had to destroy the social structure of the world. So they merely learned it was easier to control the religion rather than destroy it, and declared religious tolerance over the Roman Empire. Temples of Rome then began popping up side by side without religious persecution and teachers of many faiths taught in Rome as long as they did not discredit the Roman way of life and paid their taxes. Many prophets taught ideas and philosophies strange to Rome and allowed to speak in public. The Romans had created a the spectacle of many gods meeting on a common ground. But for the first time in recorded history, we see the situation with not just an educated and well-informed society, the, long, uh, the, the locals were allowed to draw their own conclusions considering their own respected gods. This 
also gave commoners who could not afford to travel to learn about the foreign lands and religions, no matter where they had lived, under the Roman controls, were now allowed to do so. And if they were not for such a situation, Gnosticism, Hermetics, and Neoplatonism could not have risen. <clears throat> we cannot ignore the fact that Christianity arose at about the same time, which stood against the background of Orthodox Israeli Judaism. The faith of the Hebraic Messiah spread almost like wildfire, extending through the highly conscious society. The story surrounded closely related to the Greek and Egyptian philosophies, and this discovery was attributed to the rise of the Corpus Hermetic. This means that with the rise of Christianity, the old religions and faiths were preserved and held in secret. All the old ways through Hermetic philosophy while it is uncertain whose hand had written the Corpus Hermeticum or who carried its secrets through the Dark Ages, we know from the context of their writings that during the period of religious tolerance of the Roman Empire that the authors of the Corpus Hermeticum had visited each of the religions and temples of which we're speaking of today. And so they also learned something new from each temple that they had learned that they had searched out for a universal concept of God. During their search, three groups stood out in their writings, and that was the Egyptians, the Hindus, and the Greeks. The three historical figures that were usually quoted in their universal respectiveness were Hermes, Plato, and Aristotle. The early church followers before the Council of Nicaea accepted these pagan teachers as a part of their doctrine and were originally more <coughs> platonic than Christian. The early church followers recognized certain truths that could not be denied. And the truth is the same monotheistic concept that they shared with the Hermetists and the Gnostics as a pantheistic monotheism, where God lives within creation, not outside of it. The first students of Hermetic philosophy most are namely not mentioned in the history books were said to be the hand that the universal mind used to write the Corpus Hermeticum. Many writers from this time period, most never claiming an author, were the records and accounts of the various temples and teachings of the original Gnostic and Hermetists that were first written about. They first noticed that most, if not all, the temples received all offerings, and that all offerings were usually the same, and also beginning to notice that the same number of deities were used, and the same deities worshipped in various religions had similar appearance and attributes. Therefore, the Gnostics and the early Hermetists came to the conclusion, namely, that there are strong similarities between the differences of faith. They had finally understood that there has, is, and always will be but one God, and the people across the world worshipped him under many names. The Romans were the first civilization to bear witness 
to this worship under many names. All these schools, religions, and faiths revealed their similarities to the world and the early fathers of the Christian church who had visited these various temples came to, realiza came to the realization that they all shared one basic divine human principle and that it was a single divine entity that lived inside each of the different pantheons of the empire, which means there was a universal concept of deity throughout Rome at one point in time. The Emperor Julian, with his short reign over the empire of Rome, did contemplate this unifying principle very thoughtfully when he gave his two orations, one to the Sovereign Son, uh, spelled S-U-N instead of S-O-N, and the other to the Mother of the Gods. He tells us that our own conceptions have shown him the universality of a divine principle. Unfortunately, this idea should not have forced upon men, either by Christianity or Hermetism, because already philosophy had acknowledged this point. But the old days when nations and lands were separated and exchange was minimal, the peoples did not know the benefits of their neighbors and brothers that had lived near them. As knowledge began to improve, we became more aware of these things and the public mind eventually produced this concept of over deity. The deity that did not destroy the other gods, but a new dimension of deity. A power in which all things share which was common life for all living peoples during that time. Thus, through idiom, if this concept arose in the minds of progressive thinkers, that it would be the natural substance of the integrations of creed, cult, and faith. It is also possible that the rising of such beliefs would remain secret. That men would first gather and compare ideas to escape the orthodox ways of thinking. These precious discoveries was only communicated to an elect body of people who understood these ideas and their minds could process it accordingly without persecution. <coughs> Which begins to bring us to the next point, and that is there is a strong relationship between the mystery systems and hermetic philosophy. Remembering always that behind every state religion of that time was some type of mystical or magical structure, Antiquity did not know of a belief system without mysticism, and such as now, we do not mean secret, but structures. Moral and spiritual institutions or schools, that they were labeled mysteries to prevent the profane from learning it. Any questions so far? I do have one. So... The argument you made about the one universal mind and the deities looking the same, I've also heard explanations that as one religious belief system tried to supplant the other, that they made these similarities, giving them the names of, with an overlap, so that they could convert the population that had been taken over by war. Does that ring a bell anywhere in, in your... Uh, yes, actually. Uh, we'll cover this a bit further as we go on in the lecture. Uh, but to answer your question, I believe it is the relationships between the various religions 
and the various names or concepts of deity was what created these wars. Yes, actually there is a, a huge relationship to that as we'll go forward on in the lecture. Uh, to the rise of Christianity comes with the massive destruction of antiquities. Who, who are the profane that you reference? Uh, the common the common bearer of knowledge or like the farmers, the merchants, the locals of that time period who were studied in their own local religions but were not well versed enough in various religions or other schools of thought to understand the point of view that they're trying to get across. So profane really isn't a derogatory term in this case. Profane is merely a general description of a type of peoples during that time period without insulting or giving them a derogatory statement attached to them. So profane in this case is not derogatory, but merely a general description. So it's referencing a yogal. Yeah. Okay. Or a mundane, okay. as the, the modern term for the word would be mundane. Uh, any other questions so far? Uh, these mysteries also had deeper dimensions than the general opinions of the people. A good example of this is when Pythagoras returned from his travels of the great cities of the 6th century CE after visiting all the mystery schools had professed that all religions of the world were already teaching the same things. However, the commoners had not discovered this we suspect because of the confusing outer structure of religion had thrown a heavy weight on the esoteric schools. The esoteric schools were not necessarily theological as we know them now and therefore were not quite as vulnerable today as the so-called popular religions of that time. Uh, these esoteric schools were actually institutions of higher learning. And even if you lost faith in your deities while attending these schools, you could not deny the multiplication table, or science, or value of herbs and medicine, nor the secrets of navigation and the science of alchemy. So mainly the mystery schools, as well as local religion, taught math, art, science, music, and chemistry. Things that we basically learn in high school today. Uh, where, wherever you had lost your faith or still held on to your beliefs, you could not deny math, science, and medicine. Thus, the mystery schools perhaps came forward more rapidly after the decline of the state religions. Men had a few, or I should say a new level of value in which to pin their faith to. A gradual shift from a religious belief to a scientific belief began to fall over the minds of the world. Uh, since, it, uh, since its inception thousands of years ago has begun to create a philosophical and religious philosophy of the world. Uh, the last 2,000 years have been dedicated to the simple shifting of religion and philosophy to arts and sciences. The learned minds of the time certainly knew that it, you could not destroy the school without the temple. All of this shown, shows us a picture of a universal mind as a great wanderer of law. Instead of outlandish fables of the gods, we begin to hear great teachers making possible advancements of arts and sciences, uh, the ones who were changing man's religious beliefs 
into a moral and ethical system. A system based upon adjustments instead of delusion. Uh, any questions? <clears throat> Uh, we begin to find beings like Hermes no longer telling stories about the gods or writing hymns about deities. Instead, we find him talking about structure and about universal law of living. We find a world of lawfulness and education emerging forward rapidly, apparently from out of nowhere and spearheaded by a very phantom uh, by very phantom like persons in the past 2000 years it has been no secret however that the mystery schools have gradually and quietly took humanity by the hand and led them from spiritual bondage and intellectual slavery into an age of unlimited knowledge and artificial intelligence all of a sudden, in about the 7th century CE, the mystery schools all of a sudden vanished. We have no proof as to why or how, of course, but as it is in this one's speculation that once the secret of the mystery schools was out, that the schools were no longer secret and faced punishments not written about in the history books. That And common sense also tells us this, that you cannot maintain a secret knowledge that is out, nor can you initiate uh, peoples into a secret knowledge that you can gain without it. These schools simply transformed gradually into the public mind as a recognized system. Without the Greeks and Egyptians, man could not have advanced his knowledge of electricity or atomic energy because he is using the instruments that were given to him by the Greeks, Egyptians, and Romans. Thus, from emergence of these things, we begin to see why out of the ruin of a theology which had been destroyed due to the failures of men's faith in the ancient gods that failed to protect them in times of war. There arose a new object of faith in wisdom, and this wisdom became synonymous with God. So God is no longer a symbol of power here, but a symbol of wisdom. And this was something the Greeks did not have. The Greeks had deity as an object of veneration. The Olympian gods were a frivolous lot as a whole. Even Socrates pointed out that there were not earlier, uh, they, they were, the Greek gods were not entirely admirable and that their practice and teachings were inconsistent with each other, which means that they didn't line up. There were uh, scandals among the gods as well, not even mentioned at all by the Greeks. They were whitewashed, and these scandals have been left in our history books as myths and fables revealed to us by the Romans. It's was not the state religions, however, it was the great school of philosophers rebelling against the state religion. Not rebelling against the gods, but rebelling against the literal acceptance of a doctrine that is held to have a mystical or secret meaning. Made possible, of course, by Pythagoras and Plato. It was the duty of the men like Pythagoras and Plato to enlighten and educate the minds of men. Men now began to realize that fables of the gods were actually stories of secrets and wanderers 
that could only be understood by the initiated of the sacred and mystery schools. And in these schools, the keys were given by means of which all the secrets were unlocked in their glory. Man began to acknowledge the things that he used to call frivolous. This remedy of an obvious defect of men outgrowing their spiritual infancy was the goal of the ancient philosophers. Gradually the world has finally started to catch up with them. And these philosophical teachings that were once for the few have become increasingly significant to the many. This tremendous rise of intellectual rebellion against limitations brought with it a certain inevitability of reaction. We find something very interesting that as soon as the public mind began to be highly philosophy conscious, the philosophers gradually became mystics. Uh, the teachers of the ancient mystery schools knew the public would never eventually fall on the horns of another dilemma, and that they would grow great with pride that they would start to worship their own ideas and religions as thoughts and ideas. They knew that they would adore the products of their own mind, and those who do not would lose the intuitive power of humility. This is a growing problem even today. Thus, from the beginning, we see this, uh, the pattern struggling to emerge of the great secrets from the temples could no longer be stopped. The final disbursement of the priesthoods and the pillaging of the great uh, sanctuaries scattered their teachers and preserved their teachings into the public mind from which at that time uh, was protected by the public mind. Only then could the commoners be the keepers of the mysteries, otherwise it would have died with that generation. A great danger then presents itself in this case under these events taking place <clears throat> and that some of these teachers were being thrown into Christian camps. This became a controlling factor in the evolution of the principles of wisdom of deity to the point of mental arrogance. He was a teacher, he, oh, I'm sorry, here was a teaching of brotherhood of man and to do good, to serve, to love, have faith, begins to impose itself on other faiths. In the mergings of patterns with emotional concept of mystics, knowledge and power, and the old mystery systems must overcome this issue as history has taught us in the order to preserve a universal concept of deity. This emotional conflict creates the hypocrisies of the Catholic Church, which in turn mutilated the first six centuries of the Christian era. Here we have the principle of love and wisdom drawing apart from each other, respectively trying to build a bridge while trying to absorb one another, each determining against absorption and many instances parting as foes and depriving themselves the benefit of the reconciliation and the bringing of these things together could have invoked the concept of an enlightened love and could have given us universal wisdom of divine principle much sooner than the current age.
the dividing of these two groups have never been overcome even to this day. The Christian era invoked upon the world a sense of spiritual segregation. Until today, we see the human mind as the ultimate and deciding factor in this delicate situation. Thus, Thoth and Hermes gives us a concept of a world that exists in the divine mind. The incantation of the eternal thinkers. And they tell us that the world is the non-external thought of that eternal thinker. These two beings, which gives us our creative power that creates by ways of secret attributes, this deity, of course, is a mystery god, representing attributes as a god without form, a god of all things which are the form, a god without proportions or dimensions, but containing all proportions and dimensions within its own nature, a god of seven sciences and arts, contained within its own nature, and a god ruling by the inevitable motion of its own being, and that motion, absolute law. When we begin to see this, we begin to escape from most of the type of thinking that's wrecked antiquity. We are moving forward, and we do not know why this secret was concealed for as long as it was. However, we see it popping up in certain parts of the world, even during our modern time, and it is inimited by men like Pythagoras and Plato for their initiates who have become exiled during antiquity. These factors breaking through seem to tell us beyond any reasonable doubt that this structure of the Corpus Hermeticum was the beginning of the efforts to build a complete scientific philosophical foundation under the collapsing religions of antiquity. This information had been previously perfected and that the outstanding example of this perfection would be found in the greatest architectural and legal documents of antiquity. It is concealed in the ancient monuments and buildings but is rooted in mathematics and in subjects so ancient that we can no longer trace their beginnings. There was an integrating concept of the solar system, space, time, and energy developing in this time period, and behind it all there lives something even greater than that. This double body of learning came out and stretched from Alexandria all the way to the empire of Syria. Therefore, Hermetic philosophy, Neoplatonists, and the rise of Christian era happened almost at starting at the same time. Hermetic, uh, Hermetics being the scientific phase Neoplatonism, the philosophical phase, and Christianity being the religious phase of this transition. We cannot fully overcome the knowledge of antiquity until we learn how to create the knowledge instead of retaining it. We, in this generation, are learning how to do just that. We may then say, we have creative power to exhaust the constitutions of our people. But as long as we rely on knowledge that has been previously learned, 
we lose one dimension of creativity which was the power of antiquity the power the, to be the first to know something uh, now we might say that everything worth knowing has already been learned. This is untrue because there are more firsts waiting to be discovered than any other time period in recorded history. As long as we are content to use rather than create, we lose one dimension of thinking. And that is the ability to create, which is the very thing that the Hermetic Doctrine is primarily concerned with. So that every individual creates with the mind of God, or with the universal mind of intellect, rather than against God, of God, having thoughts of God, thinking of God as an object, we begin to learn how to think with the mind of God. It is easy to see why this idea would not die. Why it has continued on and influenced. It is very easy to see these teachings in the Corpus Hermeticum the idea of a single mind. And that brings us to our conclusion of the history of Hermetic philosophy. Uh, join us next time on Wednesday, August 13th, uh, right around 6 p.m. Uh, we will be starting our new series uh, called The Ancient Mysteries of Mythologies, in which we will be starting with the subject of Christian lore. The ancient mysteries of Christian lore are a Pandora's box worth of information and would certainly hope you would join us for our next series of lectures, which certainly hopes to invoke plenty of conversation, not only after the class is over, but also online as well, through your many added comments and questions via Facebook. I am Thomas Michael Robbins, also known as Thomas Meadows, bidding you a fond farewell, good evening, and blessed be. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Remember, our episodes are live here on Entheo Radio Channel, and this is the good Captain Hugh T. Alchemy speaking with you. Um, please do check out our sponsor sites. You can find us on GildedFate.com, SteampunkAlchemist.com, and you can find our meetup group if you're in the area of Arizona, uh, meetup.com slash luckclub. Take care now.